Hello, I'm Jessica Stutzman and this is the Mill Creek Government Channel. Eating disorders can impact anyone at any age from any cross-section of the population. With over 30 million Americans suffering from an eating disorder at some point in their lives, specialized treatment is vital to the health and well-being of our community. Joining us today from the White Pine Center is Executive Director Mary Machuga and Clinical Director Brandy Montgomery. Thank you so much for joining me here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is a really important talk, a topic to talk about in our community. 30 million Americans suffer from an eating disorder. And I know we're gonna you know, talk about what those eating disorders are. Um, what is the mission? I wanna start with, what is the mission of the White Pine Center? Well, our mission is to really um, educate, treat, and advocate for uh, people who suffer from eating disorders and the community at large. Mm -hmm. And is your organization a nonprofit? Yes, we are. Okay, so with that, there's, you know, you don't need to um, necessarily have a lot of funding to get help. I mean, you know, personal funding. Um, you guys are able to serve everyone. Yeah, yeah, we are able, you know, we are credentialed with insurances mm -hmm. as far as our clinical, the, our clinical side of things, mm -hmm. and uh, including Medicaid, but uh, we are, our, our outreach and our prevention programs, community-based, are all uh, donation and grant-based. Okay. Um, when did the White Pine Center start? Uh, 2019. Wow. Uh, right before COVID hit. Yeah. And uh, we had a little open house, and mm -hmm. six weeks later, everything shut down. But we used that time to start the clinical end mm -hmm. of White Pine Center, and we were able to get that going. Mm -hmm. which was badly needed at, at that time. Absolutely. So. What was the spark or what initiated you wanting to start this facility? Well, we both have, we both come at that from different yeah. places, so go ahead. Well, um, I have been treating eating disorders for 16 years, and so it's been a niche of mine and a passion of mine. And when I moved back to Erie, I'm originally from Erie, but when I moved back from Pittsburgh, I realized that really we don't have anything specializing in treating this disorder. Mm -hmm. um, so you know how Erie is, small in circles. Mary and I um, were introduced and so I met a fellow person that um, is also just as passionate as I am, um, but she was forming it from sort of that resource prevention end, whereas um, I'm passionate about the clinical end. Mm -hmm. So we joined forces and mm -hmm. here we are today with White Pine Center for Healing. Oh, I'm so glad you did. I'm so yeah. glad you guys were in those same those same circles. Mm -hmm. um, your website describes specialized treatment for the eating disorder diseases. Mm -hmm. What again? When I was in school and and I was learning about eating disorders, we were learning a lot about anorexia and bulimia. And I mm -hmm. feel like since then there has been a lot a lot of discovery and mm -hmm. a lot more. Um, that has been brought to everybody's attention. Mm -hmm. Do you guys want to talk about, again, what, what are the eating disorders that we can look out for now? Sure. The most well-known, of course, as you said, is anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it was around 2014, 2015-ish, maybe a little bit earlier, binge eating was um, finally recognized as an eating disorder as well. Um, but then you have offshoots that aren't technically... Um, in the DSM, which is the book of how we diagnose mental health disorders. Um, so things such as orthorexia, having sort of this tendency to only want to put in the most healthiest foods into your body, mm -hmm. which that can go wrong pretty quickly, depending, so uber restrictive. Um, another one that you don't hear as much, it is in the DSM, is atypical anorexia. Mm -hmm. Um, this is where someone struggles with restrictive food intake, um, but they don't have the um, very low um, BMI to go with it. So, you know, this person could look like you or I, um, but it's still very, um, you know, detrimental to their health um, because it can go unrecognized. Because eating disorders, no matter which one you have, they sort of act like a ticking time bomb. Our bodies have this miraculous way of um, correcting whatever might be going on in the body. So no matter which one you're suffering from um, or the different offshoots, uh, we just really have to keep a, an eye on it because again, we don't know what it's affecting internally until sometimes it goes wrong. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so body dysmorphia is another one of those where um, someone can get obsessed with different parts of their body. Um, for men, it could look like, you know, um, bigger muscles. Um, for women, it could look, you know, um, similar or just focusing on a different part that they don't th feel is perfect. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. Mm -hmm. Obviously, men suffer from eating disorders mm -hmm. as well. And Absolutely. it's maybe not, again, in the typical way that we see it. Sometimes it is, but sometimes not. Mm -hmm. um, can you share, do you know a, a statistic on you know how this affects men versus women? Mm -hmm. So you mentioned of the 30 million Americans that struggle with eating disorders, about three-fourths of those are female, and then a fourth of them are men. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, depending, it it looks, the disorders look different in men, but that doesn't mean that they don't struggle. Um, and culturally speaking, um, you know, men have a harder time coming forth because it's sort of what they know. It can stem from, you know, wrestling or a different type of sport. Um, you know, maybe there's a genetic factor there within the family unit. Um, it just really just depends. But um, there's still a large population of men that struggle. Mm -hmm. yeah. And a lot of them, I think of, of fewer men are apt to get diagnosed and get help than women mm -hmm. because of the stigma. Yeah. And with body dysmorphia, I feel like as an outsider, you would say to that person, you look great, you look healthy, you look thin. <laughs> what do they see? Um, they don't see what you're seeing. And um, even if you were to compliment them and try to help their confidence, um, I call having eating disorder goggles on. It mm -hmm. distorts, their view of their body is so distorted that they're not seeing it in a way that you or I would see mm -hmm. it. So it actually isn't helpful when we say those types of things. Mm -hmm. um, and we're probably gonna get into it in a little bit. Actually, I'm gonna ask this question now. I think it's the right time. Um, what is your team's approach in responding to a patient with an eating disorder? Everybody's different. Yes, everybody mm -hmm. is different. Mm -hmm. Um, so we take a multidisciplinary approach. What that means is it's not just the therapist that works with this client. We bring the nutritional piece in because that's not our wheelhouse. So we um, immediately get them hooked up with a dietitian to address the nutrition piece. Um, and then whether it be a psychiatrist or a PCP, we also loop them in. So there's more of a case management piece to working with eating disorders because of the different um, areas that we have to get help for them with what they're struggling with. Mm -hmm. um, usually the therapist is the one that sort of is the ringleader and brings everybody together. Mm -hmm. um, but with that being said, the therapeutic modalities that really help to work through this coping strategy, mm -hmm. albeit negative, but um, are cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy. Um, but more often than not, at least how I practice and our clinic practices is we really emphasize the need to treat the trauma that drives the eating disorder. Um, so some of those things might be distorted family dynamics or um, a, a huge trauma event or small trauma events that add up to a bigger thing, you know, for that for that client to where they feel that it's not that it's a choice, but there's something that clicks in the brain where the brain is hijacked mm -hmm. and the eating disorder takes over to help them cope with uh, their struggles. Mm -hmm. And with this, is this, again, the patient or, you know, hopefully, again, we're reaching out to a viewer, but mm -hmm. is this the patient that is coming to you or is it a family member saying, I'm really worried, can you see this person? How does that work? All of the above, Both. really. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we get um, adults, uh, calling in for themselves mm -hmm. and accessing us through our website and that. Um, and then a lot of parents mm -hmm. for children. Yes. Okay. Children. And again, there's no one size fits all. Is anybody, do they ever feel, you know, cured? Is there like, you know, we, mm -hmm. how do you know when you've reached success? Sure. Well, I like to think of it as a volume dial. Um, mm -hmm. So when someone is struggling with that eating disorder voice that is separate from their own, which I know sounds a little tricky, but that's sort of the best way to explain it. Um, how we approach it is we're trying to turn that volume dial down on how strong that eating disorder voice is. So, you know, some people, when they're, you know, in the throes of an eating disorder, it's amped up to a 10. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so we're trying to inch that volume dial down through therapy, through nutrition, all of that. I like it to be barely audible, maybe like at a one, a two. Um, and the way I explain it is, 
this is where we want you to be most of the time, but we understand life happens. Mm -hmm. And so that volume dial might be ticked up, but now you have healthy coping mechanisms, you have a support system you can always fall back on. Mm -hmm. Family therapy can be a part of that so that we loop the family in. Um, so there's a lot of components to it. Yeah, yeah. And how often are you visited? Are you visited, you know, every single day, weekly? Are people in touch by phone? How does, sure. how does treatment look? So at, at White Pine Center, we are strictly outpatient because mm -hmm. there really is nothing in this area. Mm -hmm. um, we would like to bring higher level of care in, um, but that takes time. So what that means is when people are coming in, we see them once a week, but if they are really struggling, we'll see them one, two, maybe three times a week or offer them group therapy on top of their individual therapy. But if they need a higher level of care, um, we're really in touch with a lot of different um, higher level providers, like mm -hmm. inpatient or outpa um, um, intensive outpatient programs that we refer to so that they can help get the help they need and then they can step back down to us. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, that is, I just, I love this approach. I love, I love learning about this, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? I feel like, again, I feel like um, whether, you know, again, it's, it's our viewer who's saying like something's resonating here with me and, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna look back at my life and my, you know, again, my past eating patterns, things mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. or you know somebody. You know, right. I feel mm -hmm. like this has touched everybody in some way, shape, Absolutely. or form. Yeah, Every, everybody has a story. Yes. Every, everybody knows somebody. Yes. And you know, another thing that's really insidious about eating disorders is you can't get away from eating. Mm -hmm. right. You know, the triggers right. are always there. Right. Mm -hmm. So how does prevention play a role? Um, I'm the mom of a little girl, um, but past that, I want to keep all of our young children, both boys and girls, safe from eating disorders. Mm -hmm. What does, how does prevention look like? What do we do? Well, prevention programs really look at what are risk factors going into the development of body image issues and eating disorders. Uh, positive body image is a major protective factor against all risky behaviors, mm -hmm. including eating disorders. Um, negative body image is a very major risk factor. So a lot of uh, programs, especially for kids, are based on uh, body image. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some really effective programs out there for different ages and uh, we do a lot of work in schools and with groups uh, in the area about that. Uh, there are also good groups for parents. Uh, we have a very good prevention program called Confident Body, Confident Child that is for parents, caregivers, anybody with their eyes on kids. Mm -hmm. How do you be your child's best support mm -hmm. against all the things that are bombarding? Yeah. You know, and you know, the bullying, social media. Yeah. You know, it's, I didn't even it's think everywhere. about that because I mean social media wasn't around when I was a little mm -hmm. kid. So mm -hmm. I would say probably my biggest influencers were my you know, either my mm -hmm. friends in person, um, you mentioned sports mm -hmm. and then also commercials. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. commercials were really damaging, mm -hmm. um, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't even think about social media playing a role in that. Mm -hmm. um, I know that some of the messaging that has been given to us as parents as is, you know, don't make your child like clean their plate. They don't have to clean their plate before they leave plate. the dinner table. Mm -hmm. Is that the correct messaging? Is there other, you know, are we on the right path there? Yeah, we really look at food as not being good or bad. Mm -hmm. uh, we look at food being uh, either an everyday food or a sometimes food okay. based on what it does for your body, mm -hmm. how it fuels your body, mm -hmm. what it does for you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, with, with, and I guess this has been um, our philosophy is, you know, you don't want to deprive them from, you know, desserts or mm -hmm. pop or candy or things like that, but mm -hmm. we just, we talk about it in moderation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think, um, you know, and I think you've seen people, you know, when they're away from their family where they have a really strict, mm -hmm. you know, no, you know, that food is not in this house policy, mm -hmm. then they leave the house and they don't have that guidance and they kind of go crazy the other way. Yes, yeah. yeah, whether they're going off to school or whether they're just going to a neighbor's house for a mm -hmm. birthday party. Mm -hmm. And that actually, people are in, you know, they don't realize it, but they're actually teaching restricting and binging mm -hmm. by doing that. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's so true. restricting food, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, when in their age or where, where in, when in your life 
do you develop the eating disorder? Does it start really young? Does it start as an adult? Like, how does how does age play a role? Sure. More typically, it is when um, they're young children. Mm -hmm. Again, we come at it from a biopsychosocial model, which is pretty much everything we've been talking about. Biology and genetics play a factor. Um, psychology, other mental health diagnoses play a factor. And then the social is everything surrounding that child. Um, you know, school influences, social media influences, that sort of thing. Um, so we're looking at all of this. So we know that um, young children as young as early elementary school are already aware of what their body looks like. Mm. Um, and then it can cause stress for that child um, if they're getting these negative influences, um, sort of directing their um, thought or belief system about their bodies. And then it translates into who they are, this embedded embedded core belief system. Mm -hmm. um, so as young as early elementary school, but it is not unheard of to be an adult, um, sort of have a, a huge life event happen or all of a sudden become um, aware of sort of what's happened to you throughout your life to where at 50 years old all of a sudden it's like, wow, what am I doing with food? Mm -hmm. um, and then it, it is a diagnosable disorder at that point. Wow. Um, we mentioned that you know 30 million Americans are suffering from an eating disorder in our country. How does that relate to Erie County? Do we, you know, how many people do you service? So right now we have um, definitely um, actively being treated um, 150, close to 200 mm -hmm. um, within our clinic alone, and that means they're coming, they're coming to and from um, treatment, whether they're on the upswing. They'll go into school or you know their jobs or whatever. But they might come back for what I call a tune-up. But Erie County, we are seeing usually an uptick around school time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes an uptick in our um, numbers when school lets out because then we can take care of it over the summer, mm -hmm. that type of mm -hmm. a thing. So um, Erie County is is not the exception. Mm -hmm. It definitely lives here in Erie County, and um, every day we're getting calls. Every week we're getting calls mm -hmm. to. Um, somebody that's struggling and, and needs in for treatment. Mm -hmm. um, what can members of the community, schools, parents, what can we do? Mm -hmm. How do we help? What messaging do we put out there? What words do we not say at home? Sure. Um, should a scale be in the house, not be in the house? Like, just like give me, you know, your best tips for, mm -hmm. you know, the parents in the community and our viewers. Mm -hmm. Well, number one, uh, you are not only what you look like, mm -hmm. right. that you are a, a, a person of value. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that that covers a lot of the more specific things that we talk about, you know, whether it's what you're eating, you know, what you're doing, whether you're exercising, mm -hmm. all these things should be central to that message, I think. And, it's, and it should be about accepting, be, being able to accept people for who they are mm -hmm. and not, not having to grow up thinking that you're not worthy just because of what you happen to look like. Mm -hmm. which And you're born like that. Mm -hmm. Right, right. I think for parents it's difficult because we all grew up with different backgrounds. So when we're talking to our, our kiddos, you know, I too have two little girls, so I'm very aware and cognizant. And, you know, my three-year-old is playing around with the word fat, and mm -hmm. my internal is like, <gasps> You know what you're doing. You that's know. ours too. That's actually a word we don't use at yes, all. No, so, and I don't, don't know either. again if I'm doing the right thing yes, or wrong thing. Exactly. But that's a word we do right. not. Mm -hmm. No, because we don't use that word. It's um, it is looked at as negative and derogatory. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, well, you can say that's a really fat pig on the farm. You know, mm -hmm. or something like because exactly. you know that's fine. That's yes. that's really in that context. That's, exactly. That word is fine. Um, mm -hmm. But when it comes to even. We don't realize we do this, um, but let's say, wow, you're a hungry girl. You ate three pieces of pizza. Good job. But even though that sounds positive, mm -hmm. um, depending on their mood that day mm -hmm. or how they're taking it or what's being developed in that core belief system, mm -hmm. sometimes that could really stick with a child and then they'll be like, oh, is that, should I have not eaten three pieces of pizza? Like, should I, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of thing. So we just really want to be very neutral with our language centered around um, food, types of food, mm -hmm. you know, um, like we sort of discussed earlier. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we only have a couple minutes left, but again, I want to go back to your nonprofit status. Who funds the work of the White Pine Center and how do your patients benefit? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, clinically, we are credentialed with insurances, so that is that is a fee for service. But all of our outreach and education, which our clients do benefit from, also. Uh, but all of our work in schools and groups and uh, is totally funded by grants and donations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you, so again, if anybody from the school systems are listening, you're able to come and give presentations to the classroom. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. I love that so much. Um, and then what are your future plans um, for the White Pine Center? How are you guys growing and expanding? Because I know you guys always have new ideas. Mm -hmm. Well, we're looking at um, expanding. We do have some clients beyond Erie County. Okay. Uh, we are looking at expanding our services more into other counties and also our, uh, especially our prevention programs mm -hmm. into other counties. Mm -hmm. Yeah, clinically speaking, uh, we just, the clients keep coming and so our clinical, you know, department has really grown. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would really like to focus in the next few years uh, to bring higher level of care in mm -hmm. um, if we can, but then also um, providing more groups than what we already offer with different types of um, topics, such as we're planning a group for spouses or um, you know, uh, partners who have someone struggling mm -hmm. because they don't really know how to support. So, mm -hmm. and there's a lack of that here uh, in this area. So. Mm -hmm. Um, just constantly looking for holes in this with this topic that we can provide a service for. Yeah. Well, I just have to say, I, I think I loved our discussion today, and I think that you guys are doing such a wonderful thing for the community. Um, I've learned so much today, and I want to thank you both for being here and sharing this information with our viewers. How can, I'm sure we've put it down at the, the ticker at the bottom of the screen, but how can people reach out to schools, anybody interested with more you know, information, education, things we can pass out? Mm -hmm. uh, well, our website is whitepinecenter.org, mm -hmm. and that's singular pine, one pine. Mm -hmm. um, and our phone numbers are on, on the website. We have a local phone number and a toll-free number. Uh, you can also reach out to us directly on the website uh, through an email. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you both so thank much you. for being here today. Okay, thank, thank you, you so much. Viewers, um, we just learned so much about eating disorders. Again, that Erie, the Erie community is not immune from it, and we probably, if it's not yourself um, that took something away from this, something, you know, a family member, a friend, a loved one that may be suffering, and so we've got a lot of great education here at the White Pine Center for you to reach out to and learn more information about. So I want to thank you for tuning in to the Mill Creek Government Channel, and until next time, have a great day.